I am not goth, but as someone who has spent my entire adultish life in art school, I've always been goth adjacent, and I'll admit to some goth curiosity. But let's try to look past the cliches. Let's go back in time a bit. <laughs> Shocker for this channel, I know. Before Goo Goo Muck and Goth Babies. Let's explore where this lifestyle we call goth came from. The answer is both surprisingly straightforward, but also delightfully complex. <laughs> and I am not an expert. This is just a culture that interests me and I want to learn more about. A lot of this information comes from sources that I'll put in the description, but some of it comes from my own experiences. I would love to hear from anyone about their experiences, feelings. Feel free to correct me. This is hardly an exhaustive history, just put it in the comments. The culture we know and caricature today grew up in the underground club scene of the 1980s and was fueled by bands like The Cure, Susie and the Banshees, and Bauhaus. But these bands stood on the shoulder of decades of musical and stylistic experimentation from bands like Black Sabbath, Alice Cooper, The Doors, blues singer Robert Johnson, and of course, the melodramatic classical music of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Now, goth is a diverse blend of several distinct cultures. From corporate goth, to industrial goth, to kitschy goth and pastel goth, goth styling is often used to signal an edgy attitude, and because goth colors so many different facets of modern culture, it is often misunderstood, and the term thrown around to describe anything moody or emotional or the color black. High fashion loves goth. From Lee McQueen's gritty graduate collection, Jack the Ripper stalks his victims, to Garrett Pugh's consistently dark and moody collections, to more unexpected goth-ish moments like Valentino's Fall 2015 Haute Couture collection. But with all of these references flying around, where does it all come from? The term itself goth refers to the Visigoths, or the Germanic tribe of the first millennia AD. But for most of us, what we really mean when we say goth in the historical use of the word is the European architectural style that dominated from the mid-12th century to the 16th century which apparently was derived from Visigoth because the Italians of the Renaissance hated the style so much they named it after the tribe that had sacked Rome in the 5th century. Ouch. This iconic medieval style used new technology to create towering, imposing structures with dramatic elements such as vaulted ceilings, pointed arches that were heavily influenced by Islamic architecture, and huge stained glass windows that were only made possible by the structural advancements of the style. Rather like the 20th century movement, Gothic architecture broke all the rules of the previous centuries. Proportion, sacred geometry, classical order was out the window in favor of metaphysical concept. Gothic cathedrals were meant to invoke the Almighty, to remind viewers of the infinite majesty of the celestial. Dynamic facades physically showed the spiritual light and darkness, and were designed to intimidate. Perhaps what I like best about this architecture is that the bones, the structures that were so important to the overall effect, weren't hidden the way modern structure is hidden behind drywall. They were the focus of the entire thing. Like everything else from the medieval period, the 19th century loved Gothic architecture, and Gothic revival is maybe more familiar to most of us today than the real thing. Think Harvard or the Houses of Parliament in London. I'm really interested in this revival, not from a literal standpoint, but from a conceptual standpoint. This perception of Gothic architecture created an entire 19th century genre. The Victorians didn't experience Chartres Cathedral in all of its contextual glory. They experienced it as a romantic recollection of a bygone era. Most Gothic architecture was ruins by the 19th century, and this beautiful decay gave way to the morose, often macabre romantic novels like Frankenstein and Dracula. Our stage is set. Let's explore the world of the Gothic. In addition to referencing Gothic architecture, I also want to reference the fashion of the time because I think that there's a nice little like moment between the two where, you know, it's like technological advancements are kind of like pushing things forward for the first time. Just to kind of look at some of the things that were happening during this period, ignore all of these bookmarks, by the way, that is for a completely different project. <laughs> so he's 1236, so that kind of gives you a timeline. And he is wearing what is probably a rectangular tunic that is belted at the middle. There's really no shaping to any of this. This is 1388, so this is just 100 and, what, 20 years later, and you see that their bodices are fit much better to their chest and that the skirt kind of flows away, and that's because of some of the pattern cutting uh, advancements that were made at that time. So I think that it's really interesting how that kind of mirrors the advancements in architecture that allowed, 
you know, for things like vaulted ceilings and stuff. It just, you know, it's a time of technological advancement. You also see a lot of really interesting sleeve things happening at this time. She's got, you know, these slits in her sleeves are kind of hanging. Print was also very, very important during this time, and these prints would have been woven right into the fabric. And so this was a sign of status and wealth because wasn't everything during this time. This is 1445, and I'm really interested in some of these outer robes that women wore. Um, these are, you know, very similar, I think, to a hoopland, but maybe a little bit different. And so these could come in so many different styles. Some of them had a center front opening, some of them didn't. Some of them had narrow sleeves, some of them had wide sleeves. See, this woman has got like a little vertical slit in her sleeve. She's got this nice little like white trim there. I don't know, I just think that it's really interesting, kind of modern styling, all things considered. There's a similar portrait that's been really popular on Pinterest for a while. She's wearing this long blue robe and it's got this nice, I think it's like a fleur-de-lis print on it. But what I really love about the whole look, she's got these very unique hanging sleeves with a horizontal slash at the upper arm. And there's actually what appears to be dagging at the top edge of the sleeve. So I think that that is really interesting. I don't see a ton of horizontal slashed sleeves. So I know that I kind of want to reference that portrait quite a bit. I forget the technical name for these, but these little scrolls of words, I think are so visually striking. So I think I want to somehow incorporate those as well, but I don't know. Don't actually know what this says, but it's cool. I think that there's a pretty interesting parallel between some of the medieval robes and this vintage pattern. So I want to use this as sort of my base for the whole look. I also have this organza. This is a satin faced silk organza. It's like a navy blue color. It's pretty thick, pretty opaque. I have a ton of this. I actually bought it as dead stock from a brand that I used to work for. So I got just yards and yards of it for very, very little. So I know I want to use this somehow. And I also somewhere around here have some black organza, which is a lot thinner and a lot more sheer. I've noticed in a lot of modern Gothic culture that it seems to me that the, the juxtaposition between sheer and opaque seems to be kind of important to the overall look. So I know I want to play around a little bit with sheerness. I also have all of this lace. Some of this is from a lot that I bought on Etsy a while back, and some of it I actually inherited. I did show all of this lace to one of my friends who works with the textile collection of a local museum, and she told me, in her words, that this lace is not of historical significance and that the museum is not interested in it. So I want to use it somehow. This is all silk, by the way, and it is all quite old. I think that there's like a nice little, you know, moment of decay here that would be good for this project. I just need to figure out a way to use this so that I'm not ruining it. <laughs> I also have an old copy of Dracula, which is like old, like 1990s old, not old, like 19th century old. And it is falling apart and I can't really read it anymore. So I want to find a way to incorporate that into this somehow. I don't really know how that's going to work just yet, but we'll figure it out. So this is sort of, you know, where we're going with this. So yeah, let's see what we can do. I began by tracing the pattern onto the blue organza. The vintage pattern has a horizontal front seam, but I made this into one long piece. Not really sure how Our Lady Valentina gets into her gown, but I decided to leave mine open at center front. Pomegranates were a popular motif in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries. So I drew and cut out pomegranate shapes from the pages of my crumbling, didn't even have a cover anymore copy of Dracula. And these were definitely not intended to be perfect. I wanted them to be reminiscent of the paper crafts of the Victorian period. I carefully arranged these within the traced pattern. I very carefully stitched the paper cutouts onto the silk backing with black silk thread. I was not precious about this. One of the things I think is truly special about, well, pretty much any subculture in its infancy, is that they're kind of rough and raw, not polished. I also kind of like the idea of this whole endeavor having notes of being unfinished. Something romantic, perhaps ghostly, about unfinished business. Once the paper cutouts were placed, I cut out the pattern piece and covered it in the black organza. 
I based it around the exterior. I started to cut out gothic rosettes, but they morphed into the flower power flowers of the 1960s and 90s. Kind of my little nod to kitsch goth. When I read classic gothic literature, one of the main themes, to me, seems to be a preservation from death. Whether it's Frankenstein bringing something back to life, or Dracula sucking the life force from others. <laughs> I enjoyed finding my own moments for preservation throughout the project. Like Gothic architecture, I wanted to highlight the structural components that would have been new innovations for the Gothic period, so I traced a side gore into the black organza. I used this frankly ancient seam binding I've had forever to cover the raw edge of the blue organza on the wrong side. I had to think creatively about the back of the piece because I didn't have enough black organza to create two whole back panels. Instead, I kept the horizontal seam of the original pattern. Organza is very springy, especially with two layers. So I lapped the seam allowances and basted them together to avoid pressing any seam allowances open. I covered both the inside and the outside with the seam binding. This is not normally a material that is meant to be seen on the right side of the garment, but again, we're throwing out convention and highlighting craftsmanship and structural components. Plus, personally, I can't help but remember the person that this came from, so it's kind of a memento mori. I finished the center back seam of the lower back panels and overlaid half of it with the largest remaining piece of black organza. And yes, that raw edge was intentional. If it frays, it frays. Rather perfectly, one of the lace bits that was pretty far gone was the exact size of the neckband. I cut the neckband from a scrap of black organza, folded it in half lengthwise, and inserted the lace piece. I basted the lace to the inside of the crease using silk thread and a beading needle, being extremely careful to not puncture any of the lace threads. I again lapped this over the top of the neck edge of the gown. The horizontal slashed sleeves with the dagging is my favorite part of the reference portrait, so I made my own version. I slashed the front of the sleeve horizontally at the upper arm and bound the bottom edge with the seam binding. I had a bunch of this lace remnant, which is the negative space from where a larger lace motif was cut out of the trim long ago. The lace was structurally strong in the center, but the edges, of course, are disintegrating. Perfect. I sewed this onto the top edge of the sleeve slash with whip stitches. A huge part of this entire project was feeling my way through the construction, deciding when and where to leave unfinished bits, which parts needed to be secured and which parts could be left to slowly fall apart. I love that this entire piece is ephemeral. It will continue to change as time wears on. I left most of the basting in and visible, even though it's not necessarily pretty. I love that you can see layers of construction at the seams. I briefly considered doing some sort of proper hem at the bottom and the sleeves, but it just didn't seem right for the overall concept. Instead, I sewed rows of stitches at the hem, kind of like a ghostly padded hem. I knew I needed to incorporate the scrolling speech from the paintings, so I embroidered my own Latin phrases onto a three inch strip of ivory cotton sateen. Like everything else about this project, these embroideries were not meant to be polished. I used the strips to face the center front edges of the gown. I 
I prick stitched the raw edge of the strip down using white silk thread, which left tiny little flecks on the right side. I whip stitched the edges of the neckband closed. I used another binding strip to enclose the raw edges of the inside of the neckband. I have only scratched the surface of what goth is, but I do think subversivism and a desire to push past society's expectations is something probably most, if not all, goths have in common. Anyway, the scound turned out a little wizardy, but I still like it. I definitely want to explore this concept and genre further and develop some of these ideas. If you enjoyed this video, I always appreciate a thumbs up, and hit subscribe if you enjoy historical, modern, uh, increasingly art school kiddish experimentation. Until next time, bye!